Good morning, everyone. One of my favourite movies is The King's Speech, a movie where the Australian speech therapist Lionel Logue helps King George VI with a stutter that he has. And there's one scene where they are preparing for his coronation. They're there in Westminster Abbey, and the king turns around to see Lionel sitting in a chair. Not just any chair, this is the coronation chair, St. Edward's chair, a 700-year-old throne that is only ever used for this one specific purpose. You can see the, ch the shock in the king's eyes. He says to him, you can't sit there, get up. You can see that he is thinking, what gives you the right to think that you can sit there? This is a very funny part of the movie, but I think it helps illustrate the issue that we can sometimes face in our lives as Christians. We can think to ourselves, what gives us the right to approach God? What gives us the right to call him Father? And the more we understand what he has done for us, the more audacious it can seem to come before a God who is so great, who is so powerful. But the big idea from today's passage, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 35, is that because of Jesus, we have confidence to boldly live the Christian life. And so we see in this passage that we can confidently draw near to God. Secondly, we see the terrible alternative that awaits us if we refuse. And thirdly, we're reminded to not let our confidence fade throughout our lives. So first of all, let's look at verses 19 to 25, how we can confidently draw near to God. And this is a passage that builds on so much that has come before. It starts with, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. And that's a big therefore. All the description of Jesus conquering our sin, his fulfillment of God's plan, his kingship and our adoption as God's sons because of him is built into that therefore. And it builds again in verse 21. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, looking forward to what is going to be fulfilled. When it talks about entering the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, the holiest of holies is the part in the temple that was only entered by the whole high priest only once a year and only on the day of atonement. But now it's not the blood of an animal that is being spilled. It is Jesus' own blood. He is the great sacrifice and the great high priest. So, in light of this, verse 22 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Now this is boldness. To the Jews who were listening to this being read out for the first time, it would have seemed like boldness verging on audacity. Because their relationship with God was based on the tabernacle, on the temple. Both concepts of how they could approach God that physically separated them from God. They were designed in such a way that there was physical separation to show that they couldn't approach God, that only a priest could approach God, and then only under special circumstances. They could only dream of drawing near to God as their father. I remember once when I was a child, being in a crowd, looking for my mum, turning seeing what I thought was her raincoat, running and gr grabbing onto it. Obviously, this wasn't my mum. It was someone wearing a similar raincoat. I then spotted my real mum over on the other side of the crowd. This is something that I'm sure has happened to lots of kids. And it's because 
our desire is to see what is familiar, to see what we want to draw near to, our parents, and to do that as quickly as we can. We can draw near to God. And in verses 23, 24, and 25, there are three ways that are outlined how we can do that. First of all, we can hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess in verse 23. It's almost as if when you're driving, there are road signs, there are brakes, there's the steering that you trust to hold you unswervingly. You trust that you are going to get where you want to go because of the training that you have had, because of the car that you are driving. We can have the same trust to be able to hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess when we train ourselves through God's word, when we trust how he promises that he has fulfilled his promises and will continue to do so. We can also consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds in verse 24. This is more than mere encouragement. Spurring one another on, it implies encouraging one another almost to the point where it could be painful. A spur used on an animal, they're on people's shoes and dig into the side of the animal to the point of pain, to the point of discomfort, to show the animal which way to go. Maybe sometimes we need tough love among each other to be able to spur one another on in this way. To encourage one another not to give up on the faith faith that we have, but instead to love one another and to serve one another. And in verse 25, we're encouraged also not to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. And this is the kind of verse that it would be so easy to rip out of its context and say, aha, this means you have to come to church every week. No ifs, no buts. While I think it is very important to come to church and to be part of a Christian community, this verse actually gets a lot deeper than mere attendance. It's important for Christians to meet together as a family, to encourage, support, serve, and love one another. And I think that has been shown more than ever over the last few months when we haven't been able to meet together physically as we would like. We've still been able to encourage one another uh, by using various means of technology, and we can thank God that we have been able to do that. But I think we can also thank God that soon we will be able to meet together again as we have always wanted. The fact that we haven't been able to gather in the way that we are used to has helped us to long for what we are missing and to see how important it is. So, we're encouraged to hold unswervingly, to spur one another on, to not give up meeting together, And what would the opposites of these be? Would be to withdraw from Christian gathering, to stop doing public expressions of faith and to give up on the commitment to Christ and our hope in him. And this is the terrible alternative that we see in the next section of this chapter, verses 26 to 31. Verse 26 says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. When you see a packet of cigarettes, there's always a warning on the packet. Not just in words, but in pictures as well, graphic pictures of what can so easily happen to someone who smokes for a long time. The kind of damage that can be done both on the inside and on the outside as well. And this isn't there as a threat. It's there as a warning. The same goes for passages like this one in the Bible. They're not there to threaten us. 
They're there to warn us of the consequences of giving up on Jesus. Verse 28 and 29 say, Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Passages like these can be hard for us to read and even harder for us to take to heart. On the one hand, we can read them thinking that we are disqualified from God's love, from his forgiveness, because of the sin that is still in our lives. And yet, as we saw in last week's passage in verse 14, we are at the same time, when we trust in Jesus, perfect in God's eyes, and also being made holy, that is, a work in progress. So when we do come before God and repent, we will never be disqualified from the forgiveness that he offers us in Jesus. But on the other hand, we also need to take seriously what passages like this teach us about God's character. He truly does hate sin. Yes, God is loving. Yes, God is merciful. But we can't fully appreciate how loving and how merciful he is unless we come to grips with how much he hates the sin in our lives as well. Those who have turned away from the work of grace accomplished in God's Son, they're faced with such a serious situation. That's because the new covenant is better than the old covenant. The new covenant priest is greater than any old covenant priest. And the new covenant sacrifice is superior in any way, every way to any sacrifice that was made before. Therefore, if people are going to reject what is offered here, they are rejecting the only way out that God has offered us. You might have heard before the story of the man who is drowning and praying to God for help, who then is thrown a life preserver and yet rejects it, saying he is still waiting for God's help, ignoring the fact that God answered his prayer with the life preserver in the first place. And yet in this instance, I think the better analogy would be If the man had seen a life preserver come directly from heaven and yet instead of taking it, decided to take out a knife and slash it to pieces in front of him. We know we can always ask God for forgiveness, but if we close the door on Jesus once and for all, there is no other door available to us. And so, the third part of this passage is an encouragement for us to not let our confidence fade in verses 32 to 35. It says in verse 32, Remember those early days after you had received the light, when you endured it in a great conflict full of suffering. If you were to talk to your past self, How would they encourage you to live for Jesus? I'm not saying that our greatest times of faith are always going to be in the past. If we trust the word of God, then we are growing more and more like Christ throughout our lives. And yet, when we first became Christians, when we were first gripped by the love of Christ in our lives, when we first truly took to heart who Jesus was and what he had done for us, what would we advise our future selves? How would we encourage our future selves to hold on to that truth? 
In verses 33 and 34, the writer of Hebrews has encouragement for the people he is writing to along these lines. He says, Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. There are Christians around the world today who suffer persecution, who end up in prison, who lose property for the sake of the faith that they believe in. During our years in Canada, we were part of a church that had lost its property because it wanted to remain faithful to the gospel. The Anglican church in that part of the world had gone through many years of upheaval because there were those among them who wanted to walk away from the truth that is in the gospel. They had more and more treated the Bible not as God's word, but as something where they could pick and choose and apply however they wanted. And so this led to a situation where, about, where many churches uh, had left the official Anglican church and formed their own group instead. The, many of these churches did lose their buildings, and yet they had great joy knowing that they had contended for their faith. They had great confidence in God and they grew in their faith through these times of adversity. They grew together as a community to better serve one another and those around them and to better share the gospel with the community as well. And so verse 35 says, Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. So how do we today identify with Christ and his church? What price are we willing to pay for associating with him? How are we willing to show those around us that we draw near to God in our lives? How do we speak about God? Not just talking about the church or Christian ideas, but about God himself. For example, if we say that we're blessed, are we willing to say that God is the one blessing us? If we tell someone that we'll pray for them, do we also tell them that we believe in a God who hears our prayers and delights in answering them? Are we prepared to spur one another on to the point where it might even be uncomfortable for us? Are we prepared to face persecution, to face loss for the sake of the gospel? Because what could possibly give us the right and the hope and the audacity and the boldness to speak and act in this way? Well, according to this passage, Jesus does. By his blood, we have the confidence to boldly live the Christian life that he has laid out for us.